Hello everyone and welcome again to Contact Lost, the podcast from Poland about competitive Warhammer 40,000 and uh, today it's just Joker leading the charge and with me is a special guest to talk about one of the new codices that are just freshly released and uh, Neil Tag. Hello everyone, I'm in Good morning, good evening. I don't know whenever you are listening to us, but yeah, it's oh, nice, to, nice to be here. <laughs> All over the world. And uh, Neil Tag will talk with me uh, about Necrons today. So, yeah. uh, Neil Tag, you're fairly fresh uh, in the Polish competitive scene. I think you started somewhere in mid 8th edition. Uh, it was around the beginning of, uh, it was, uh, I think, December 2017 or something like this. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it's it was like end of 2017, I think. Okay, so that's, that's a bit earlier than mid-8th. That was shortly after the release. And um, did you start playing competitively straight away? Yes, I mean, I, I don't see any reason to play a game like this non completely and I, I just, whatever I'm trying to play, I'm um, in Solace trying to be as much competitive as I can. Okay, cool. So uh, the last point on that note then, uh, why Necrons? <laughs> okay, so uh, before uh, Warhammer uh, 40k, I played uh, Warhammer uh, Fantasy Battle. And as you can guess, I was playing vampire cons, <laughs> and that's why I like like metal skeletons. And then I moved to Age of Sigmar, where I played Death, which is also like a vampire is connected with a, every sort of whatever was dead there. So again, skeletons. And so when I decided to start playing Warhammer 40k, which I always it was like kind of wanted to try it, but never had time for it. Uh, so I look on the all armies and I stop on the Necrons and I said, okay, that's that's mine. And that's, that's, this is how I chose it. I mean, I, I just like how they look, how they are, what their story. I know it's changed during different collectives, but I like either version of them. Uh, there are people that prefer one or other version, but I just accept all of them. They are just you no know, my I just feel good playing this kind of army. Okay, so you seem to be a skeleton man, a <laughs> fan of spooky boys of all kinds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, wasn't. I wasn't looking at like their strength or strength or anything like this or competitive. I, I was. I think I was asking one person from like Polish competitive scene when I was choosing the army about how the next records are currently, and they said that they suck. I said, well. Well, I don't really care. I like them and I will just play them. So, yeah. Okay, that's that's interesting. And uh, yeah, Necrons were deemed one of the worst armies throughout almost all of 8th edition. But then Until you came I up started. with some builds. <laughs> yeah. and, Until uh, I started playing them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually had quite a bit of success with some lists. But we'll get to that later. Uh, sure. Let's then jump in straight into the new book and uh, for all of you listening to us here we're going to run this faction focus uh, a little bit differently we're not going to go by each data sheet stratagem one by one uh, as that's uh, well that's already been previewed by a lot of other podcasts uh, youtube channels or whatnot so we're just going to analyze uh, what's new, how it's working, and uh, how it affects the builds that were playing before this codex release, and how lists might look like going forward. So let's start with some first impressions of, of the codex. The basic army-wide attachment rules being uh, obviously dynastic codes, uh, the new command protocols, and maybe a little bit of stratagems. So, uh, Neil Tag, what do you want to start with? Well, I mean, firstly, I'm like like a kid during the Christmas because <laughs> before 9th edition, you had like one or two builds for Necrons. 
and that's all. I mean, you could make like little tweaks about them, but I think we will talk about the builds later on. So I'm not gonna focus on it now, uh, but there was like no flexibility at, at all. And now, you know, when I read the book for like four or five or I think so like six or even more times already, <laughs> I read the whole book and I have like 10 or 12 ideas for a list and each of them is competitive and each of them uh, play totally different and each of them ha have some other ways to play and in for example in team tournament uh, you can fit like necrons for every slot you would like you need like army that can survive and like give you let's say 10 12 points you can build them you want to like make uh, vicious combat killers you can make them you want to make like shooting list you can make them you want to make like monsters you can make, get them so i really like that now there are many models that are very cool and have different uses of course there are some crappy data sheets here as well uh, but overall you can build like many many different types of necros here Okay, well, that, that sounds very optimistic, and uh, that's good to hear, actually, because that's how I think everyone would want their codices to, to look like. A plethora of choices, and then to be able to build a army that suits your playstyle, but still is from your favorite faction. Uh, right, so uh, maybe let's start in order. I think the dynastic codes... Uh, they're not exactly new. I mean, we've already had them in the previous edition, but they have changed a bit, quite a bit. Well, they changed a lot because they, I mean, before they were, well, some minor buff and that's pretty all. And plus some one strategy, right? Now you still have one strategy per dynasty, but the dynastic codes are more depth and they more uh, require, I mean, they are, um, more like each dynastic code is connected with some a little bit different play style or different list. So there are like dynastic codes that are better for some kind of list and there are other dynastic codes that are for other kinds of list. And you can mix them around and like make more all around list as well. So uh, I really like what they did with this. And additionally, the dynastic codes are connected to the uh, command protocols. So each dynastic code is but in each dynasty is better in one of the command protocols, which are kind of new rule for Necron. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool. And so the, the command, uh, maybe, maybe I will, I mean, do you have any questions for the dynastics or we can go to the command protocols, um, which are like connected to the dynasties. Yeah, maybe I'll just say that there are uh, dynastic codes for six of the existing, let's say, dynasties, the uh, ones existing in the law, and then you can also make your own, uh, yeah. which I think was very much missing in the Psychic Awakening book. That was a bit of a letdown, I guess, at the time. Yes, uh, and you can make some nice choices here for example you can make your whole army objective secured and be able to move before a battle six inches which is yeah i think that's that's a very nice that's an outstanding combo no i mean there are some other combos as well which are pretty cool for example if you like to make like canoptic army so for all of rights uh, uh canoptic spiders etc uh, you can for example pick the one of the parts of the dynastic code that adds one to the movements the characteristic of the conaptic models and make your pilings uh, four inches. So, and, and consolidation as well for inches. So your conoptic models are much more faster. And on the other part, you can give, for example, them objects is secure as well. <laughs> so, or add one to charges. So you have like one additional movement plus one to charges and four inches piling and consolidation for like let's say rights which have 12 inches move yeah they become very fast very quickly yeah uh, in such combination and uh yeah so um you've mentioned a couple of combinations already but any favorites here uh to be honest i pr really like nihilak the standard nihilak one 
-hmm. which is uh, that gives you objective secure on each of your models in her army and in additional if your model have already objective secure it's count as double so let's say you have blob of 20 warriors they are they count as 40 man unit so good luck you know moving it from the objective and they yeah, additional way yeah and additional thing from the code is that they ignore armor penetrates of minus one so they treat armor penetrates minus one as zero uh, when you are in your deployment zone so when you are starting game and you are always in your whole deployment zone i mean it's pretty hard to move you from you know from your zone mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, and uh, they benefit. Uh, they use both directives from Protocol of the Eternal Guardian, and that one is, which will uh, give us a smooth transition to discuss the command protocols themselves. Yeah. So, uh, so Eternal Guardian is that uh, each. I mean, your your army is uh, when you, when you don't move or fall back or advance, you are treated as being in light cover. So, uh, for example, if you don't start a battle and you choose this turn or this uh, protocol as the first one, you can't as didn't move in this battle round. So your army, a whole army, is written as being in light cover. You are obsec and you ignore AP minus one. So it's pretty hard to get them off your starting zone. And yeah, the second, second directive is pretty nice as well for them. Because, as you said, you can, uh, because they are in HELAC, they get two uh, uh, directives from this protocol. And the second one is that whenever someone charges you, uh, you can use this hold steady, which gives you overwatch on unmodified five and sixes. Uh, or you can uh, set to defense, which gives you plus one to hit in close combat, I think, right? Mm, yeah, in, in the fight phase. Yeah, so you got benefit of both of those directs, which is maybe, you know, Overwatch on first turn, not for uh, uh, versus every army, but it's useful. Yeah, definitely against some of them. Or if you pick some more combat units, then you can get plus one to the hit roll. That's also nice. Yeah. Uh, right. So let's jump to the command protocols and uh, I'll just start by shortly explaining how these work. So essentially there are six protocols to choose from. Uh, each of these has two effects called directives and uh, when they kick in you pick one directive to act in a battle round. Uh, now, before the battle begins, out of the six protocols, uh, you assign one of them to each of the battle rounds. So uh, one is left out and then the other five that you pick uh, kick in in the respective battle rounds that one ha that you have picked. And then when they start uh, working, you pick the directive that effect, which effect is more desired. And uh, as we've said, the dynasties that have uh, their dynastic codes, the ones existing in the law, uh, each of them uh, benefits from both directives from one of the protocols. And uh, well, like in the example of uh, Nihilak and the Eternal Guardian that we've just discussed. Okay. There's one more condition actually, uh, which you didn't mention, is that your army need to have a noble character. Uh, to have the command protocols to work. So you need to have Catacomb Command Barge, Overlord or Lord as your characters in army and they need to be your Warlord for this battle. Uh, it comes for the um, special characters as well. So like uh, Emotech or Silent King or other guys and they need to be your Warlord to command protocols work. And if you don't have Noble on your, on your board at the beginning of the battle round, the command protocols are gone and you cannot you know start them okay okay yeah that's that's a valid point uh good good mention there uh all right well we've gone through the eternal guardian so uh any comments on the other five well i mean they are different for different type of you know i mean uh, how I see them is that I will probably pick different combinations on on when you choose which protocol for different type of you know it it all depends on the 
battleground. It depends on who are you playing with and yeah, definitely. what army you're playing. So, I mean, if you see, for example, that you're playing versus like super shooty army that is going to, you know, wipe you off the board, you will probably pick the first turn, uh, which gives you cover or something like this. Or if you want to move to the objective fast, there is a protocol that gives your whole army, well, not all, because the protocols only work in six inches from characters, uh, but it gives you plus one to movement. And with connection, with, uh, when you combine it with the other aura that some characters have, uh, it makes you like plus two movement for your whole army, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think it's nice to see that there seems to be a tendency for uh, additional army-wide rules if you keep to a specific faction, like the doctrines from the Space Marines. And uh, well, this is both similar and a lot different at the same time, I'd say, because well, the conditions are all, well, they are pretty similar, but then these are seem a lot more flexible. Uh, yes and no. So, uh, what, what how I see them is that they are pretty uh, hard to master. I mean, they are they might be easy to learn. They are hard to master to choose which one uh, should be assigned to each round versus different opponents. And if you make some small mistake, it may, it may happen that you doesn't use this directive at all. So if you choose like, uh, for example, uh, there is a protocol of Hungry Void, which improves your combat skills in close combat, right? And if you assign it to wrong turn where you are not in close combat, this protocol is wasted at all. So you need to choose wisely on which turn you choose which protocol to don't waste it. Yeah, agreed. And um, is there any way to manipulate the protocols? I think there is just one and it needs either Sharek or, or just his dynasty. Uh, there are two ways. Yeah, as you said, one is the Sharek, uh, which uh, uh, his uh, special rule gives you option of alternating a, a protocol to the one that wasn't chosen. So you assign five of them uh, and you have six. So the sixth mm -hmm. one can be assigned to whatever turn you like. But when you have Sharek on the board, he needs to be your warlord because this is really for Necrons. When, he, when Silent King is on the board, he always needs to be your warlord. And when he's your warlord, he needs to pick the warlord from the uh, Shrakhan dynasty, which is uh, which allows you to pick only four protocols from pool of six and use one of them on two turns. So you have like a Eternal Guardians to turn one and turn two, and then three different on three other choices. So, and then you can use the Silent King special rule, which you can choose one of two left protocols and assign it to whatever turn you like. So there is uh, some flexibility, uh, but I think the it's worth you know, learning how to assign proper protocol to different rounds versus, of course, different opponents. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like you said, this seems quite easy to learn, but hard to master. There's definitely potential here to to really get the effectiveness of these rules and uh, yeah, power up your metal guys very much. Yeah, right. the thing that I most like at the protocols is that you keep them secretly from your opponent until you, they are revealed. So you write down on your uh, roster or on the, some paper uh, which protocol is in which, in which battle round and you don't show it to your opponent until this protocol is active. So they, are, they have no idea uh, what next protocol can come. Uh, and uh, this is the difference between ball discipline Bolter discipline that Marines have and command mm -hmm. protocols. I mean, when you are playing versus Marines, you know that first is uh, doctrine is the devastator, right? And yeah. here you have no idea what's going to be on first turn. Really, <laughs> you can guess by looking on the enemy army, but you are never sure. You know what they left, what they are choosing, uh, on which turn they are trying to do what, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if, if if I knew that my opponents are just about to go into the Hungry Void protocol, then I probably might want to try avoid combat. But then since it's secret, you never know when it's kicking in. Yeah, that's definitely a, 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 an upside to that. 
Right, and uh, what about stratagems? I think there's a lot of them have disappeared. There are quite a few new ones. Some of them have changed. It's bas They've basically been rewritten, really, haven't they? Uh, well, there are some... Uh, uh, there are a few sessions that were before. For example, there is extermination protocol from your destroyers, but it's weaker now. Now it costs two CPs and instead of one, and it only gives you reroll wound rolls, not real wound rolls and hit rolls for them. So it's much weaker, uh, but it's still here. There are a few more strategies like plus one to hit rolls for your triarch uh, Praetorians uh, units. Uh, like Dimension Corridor for teleporting your infantry models to Monolith or uh, like resurrecting your character as well. Uh, but there are many new ones which I am so excited about them. For example, you can finally give World Trade to other characters in your army. You don't need only, you don't, you don't have to have only one. You can have two now. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and Playing Strike Force missions, you can actually have three Warlords yeah. uh, in that regard. So, so uh, I think that's very nice the way that they've changed that stratagem. Oh, well, okay, for Necrons it's new, but it works similarly for Marines now. And the same go one goes, I, I think, think the same goes for the Relic been, one. Right? Yeah, I mean, Relic was always here, but I mean, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Other armies have, I mean, a lot of armies had these additional war traits already, and I think the Necrons were like one of the few that didn't get because I think it was added in Psychic Awakening, right? Yeah, mostly, mostly and I think. Psychic Awakening for Necrons was not existing at all. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, there was just the data sheet for Shadows, um, which yeah, was anyway. changed in book. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> and it's much better now. I mean, sh oh, I I love this model really. Okay, we'll get to that guy. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, I think uh, it's very nice that now that stratagem, the Warlord trait one and the Relic one, well, first of all, it's nice that they're there for every faction, hopefully, and that they're scaled to the mission size as well. Uh, yeah, that's nice. So we yeah. don't have in like 500 points of three Warlords, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, that would be, that would be a bit ridiculous, kind of. Yeah. And, well, it's good to have the more wall of traits if you can. Yeah, I can uh, give you a hint of some like two stratagems that you can that were before but could change a lot, for example. Uh, for example, there was Entropic Strike stratagem from one CP in eighth edition, which was like your character's first attack was ignoring in Vermont safe. And it's like mm -hmm. super trash because I was always missing or not wounding <laughs> with this stratagem. And I really hated it. But and it's only one it was only one attack. It wasn't even yeah. all the attacks of that character, it was just the first one. Yes, and now they change it and now it's two CPs and only works on Katan shards, but you ignore in Vermont states for all of your attacks. And it's pretty sweet. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and the second big change is like solar pools. I don't, I'm not sure if you remember this such gem. It was like you no, when you I were saw the name, but not really the effect. So it was one CP like it's now, and it was like that when you were shooting your unit into an enemy, uh, you could remove the cover, uh, benefits of cover against this attack, right? Mm -hmm. But it was only for Eon Win. And now it works like this that you select the enemy, but your whole army is ignoring benefits of cover for this uh, unit. So you are moving light cover, you are moving dense cover, you are moving like everything from them. Yeah, that's that that's that's an improvement, definitely. So yeah, I mean there are many new stratagems, but I don't think that we wanna discuss all of them right now, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Let let's not go that deeply into that. And um, what about Warlord Traits and Relics? Uh, they haven't changed that much, I think, have e they? Yes. I mean, um, so for Warlord Traits, they changed just a little bit. For example, you don't have uh, Immortal Pride. Or Pride was changed mostly. So Immortal Pride before was you were immune to Morale Test for every unit in six inches. Now it only uh, like uh, makes you that the compact attrition test uh, cannot be uh, actually ignore all or or modifiers, so you cannot you now go plus one or minus one. It's always on one. So 
<laughs> that's a big change to it. But rest of them is pretty much the same for the world, uh, for the world trade. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the relics, so <laughs> that's funny thing because uh, the few of them are still the same. They ha they have few little tweaks to them. For example, like all everyone's favorite veil of darkness, which mm -hmm. everyone was using to teleport your destroyers <laughs> into enemy head and like blowing them up. Now it only works on the core units. So either your warriors, immortals, lich guards, uh, death marks, or tomb blades. Yeah, you can teleport tomb blades with your veil of darkness now, uh, if you like. Uh, but yeah, that's the big change. Yeah, and there aren't many core units. As you said, it's just just five of them that got this keyword, which seems to be uh, well, most buffing effects only affect core units. Uh, uh, no, not really. I mean, there are... F so now in Necron Codex, you got like three different, let's say, sub-fractions. One is the core units, one is a destroyer cult, and third is a Knoptex. So, uh, and there is the left and the rest of them, right? So there are like three ways of buffing three different types of units. Uh, you have buffs for core units, you have different buffs for destroyer cult units, and you have different buffs for Canoptic units. So, I mean, if you want to build Canoptic army, there are ways to buff them. If you want to make a destroyer army, there are ways to buff them as well. But they are not so good as uh, core units, but they still can use some buffs for yeah, them. Yeah, but they have something going for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh as for there... Rake, one more thing. I mean there is one mm -hmm. additional thing which is like super new and it's a cryptic arcana. Yeah, which... that's what I was going to mention just now that there is something new and uh, the cryptic arcana. So uh it's yeah, great. go on. So basically how it works, you can improve your cryptic and there are like four different uh different types of cryptic now. And mm -hmm. each of them can have different upgrades. There are some of the upgrades that are for all of them, but there are some which are only connected to this type of cryptic. And you can choose one of those upgrades per cryptic, and you can give them to like uh, name characters, of course. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all. Uh, and some of them are pretty cool. For example, there is one which uh, improve the attack characteristic of your Coneptic units in nine inches of the bearer, and it's for Technomancer. And it gives one plus, attack, plus one attack per each model, and if it's a monster or vehicle, it gives plus, plus D3. And you can think, what Coneptic monsters are there for Necrons, right? Oh, I know, there are spiders. Yes, and the spiders, oh man, I mean, they are crazy though. Really, I mean, <laughs> you can remember in 8th edition there were spiders. I mean, I think no, no one knew them, right? I have <laughs> never seen one through the whole of 8th. Uh, there is a pretty big chance that you will see units of three of them running now. And with right buffs from the uh, Cryptex, uh, you can have them like uh, six movement, three plus uh, weapon skin and ballistic skill, six strength, six toughness, six wounds, and five attacks, and with the cryptic, you can have five attacks plus the three per each model uh, in the unit, and they are hitting you with strength eight minus three and two damage. <laughs> have fun with them. Yeah, well, if if they're your unit, then you can definitely have fun with them. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> they sound quite fun. And as all Necrons now, they have living metal, reanimation protocols, and command protocols. So. They will benefit from all of them. Yeah, but the reanimation protocols, I don't think they will work wonders for that unit specifically, because those yes have no. changed as well. Yes and no. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is uh, like split opinion about command protocols. Some people say they are better, some people say they are worse. I think they are much better, because before, in 8th edition, uh, I don't remember rolling for protocols at all because <laughs> when <laughs> someone was shooting my unit, they always wiped it to the dust already. I mean, if you want, you wanted to kill something, you were just shooting your whole army to it and just killing it, and you didn't roll any protocols at all. Now, okay, I admit they are worse for the units with like multiple wounds, like Conoptic spiders with the six wounds. 
I don't think that he will ever roll it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that was my point exactly. There are ways on those spiders. There are ways to improve it. So let's say you have units of three of them. Uh, protocols work now that you roll one uh, d6 per each wound from the for, per each model per each wound that was lost, right? Uh, so if you lose one, you lose like if you roll like six dices, and you need to roll six five pluses to get one spider back, which is pretty like you have like one point one percent or something like this for this. Pretty I think low. It's fair to say it's unlikely. <laughs> yes, uh, but there are ways to improve it. I mean, for example, uh, there is a cryptic arcana that lets you bring back once per battle one dynastic canoptic model. So you can bring back a spider with it, which costs like 70 points. And this buff for a cryptic costs like uh, 30 points. So you are like 40 points you know, uh, back with it. Mm -hmm. And there is a reanimation orb, um, resurrection orb as well, which can, you, let's say you get unit three, you lost two of them, and you can use resurrection orb of them and draw those protocols for two of the models, and there is a big chance that one will go back. Uh, yeah, there are many ways to improve your protocols now, really. And I shouldn't be worried about them really worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think they're just different, right? It's just a bit different. The way the mechanic works is just sim is simply different. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, probably for the better, definitely for warriors. And uh, we'll see. And I mean, honestly, warriors I have... and immortals, right? Really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I haven't really uh, dug that deeply through that codex, but talking to you now, I'm also getting excited because there seem to be so many interactions you can pull off between the units and all of the units almost in the book. So that is just amazing. Right, from army-wide stuff, let's call it, we've got the 10 powers left. And I think there also aren't that many changes here. I think they, yes the no. names are the same. Names are exactly the same, uh, but they are buffed by a lot. I mean, so let's say, let's take one for example, right? I need uh, uh, Antimatter Meteor. Before, and in 8th edition, it was uh, you roll d6 and you deal uh, for a roll of 2 to 5, you were dealing uh, d3 mortal wounds to the closest visible enemy in 24 inches. And if you rolled 6, it was d6 or mortal wounds, right? Now you roll uh, again d6, and it again works on the closest visible unit ban, but on the roll on, of 3 or 5, it's flat free mortal wounds. And on the roll of the 6, it's free plus d3. Mm, yeah, that, that's an improvement, definitely. Yes, and if you are using it from Tesseract Vault, you get plus one to roll on it. So from two to four, so on, on one, nothing happens. On two, three, or four, you deal three mortal wounds. And on five or six, you deal three plus d3 mortal wounds, which is huge, really. I mean, it's every turn. And the funny thing, it's oh, it's like before in your end, end of your movement phase, so there are if you someone have some you know um, ski, i mean uh, like uh, abilities that ignore mortal wounds from like spells or whatever it's not a spell you cannot deny it at all yeah 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 that's definitely an advantage over the regular psychic powers and uh, they just go off it's not like you, yeah. need, you need a test, you only roll on the amount of mortal wounds. It's... Yeah, and there are three new powers, actually. Yeah. Uh... And they are connected to different name katans. Uh, we can go through them if you want to. Yeah, sure, let's do. I mean, I think the the one for the Void Dragon was previewed on Warhammer Community, so there isn't that much uh, to say okay. about it. I, I mean, remember. It... Uh, it's something, to, it's got a lot to do with vehicles. Yeah, but yeah, well, well, whole void dragons have to do a lot of vehicles. <laughs> uh, Surprisingly, okay. yeah. So let's, I mean, let's start with Deceiver, uh, which is like I think the weakest of the Catans, but he got pretty nice power 
which is you select one enemy unit with 12 inches of him, and you can select characters with it as well, because it's not shooting attacks, so you can select whatever you mm -hmm. like with it. And you roll d6, and I mean, each of you roll d6, and you compare it with your leadership, and you deal that much of mortal wounds, which is a difference of, you know, uh, of the results. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you got like seven leadership and Katan's got like 10, it's pretty much you will get like three or four mortal wounds per character. It, it usually kills them. Yeah, it's possible. It's definitely possible to take out a character <laughs> that was not careful enough and walked into the range of that power. Yeah, so it's 12 inches and you get like eight movement. So it's pretty big range, I think. And then it's Nightbringer, which is, uh, again, you can still target a character with it. It's nine inches range and you roll 3d6 and for each uh, four plus you deal three d3 mortal wounds. So you can snipe a character with it as well. Yeah, it seems like you can do it even more reliably than with the <laughs> power of the deceiver. Yeah, <laughs> so they are pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and the last one is the Void Dragon, and th with that you can't actually pick a character. It's it says yeah. so. You uh, can if it's that, above uh, ten wounds, yeah. right? Ten or more. Yeah, yeah, obviously, and uh, or if it's the closest visible enemy unit, yeah. well, so pretty much look like out that applies here. Yeah, like in shooting. Yeah, and it. I mean, if you are it, it deals the three mortal wounds to the unit on two plus, and if it's a vehicle, it deals d six. Uh, mortal wounds and additional if you bracket it it counts as uh, twice less wounds than it have it's pretty yeah. cool yeah it's it's cool but it's a, it's a gimmicky one i mean it yeah. needs to target a vehicle to make sense really i think right uh i think we've covered the army wide rules uh yeah we've talked about most of it so um next in the book are secondary objectives uh, now there are four of these and uh, as of today we have no idea how WTC will approach these whether they will be allowed in tournament From games or not what I know they will allow it at last for now okay that's interesting uh, I've heard that uh, they're not really willing to do that but not many people had spoken out at the time so yeah I mean it's nice to see the trend uh let's go I mean, shortly through them because there's not that many and uh well honestly i think it's not like they are overpowered anyway. uh, they are pretty powerful i mean uh, the, the the only thing is that, so you get like three different categories of those stratagems i mean three of those uh missions, secondary, yeah. and you can only pick one of them uh you can't like go free of the necros one you can just pick the one of them you cannot go for all of them and you only replace the one from oh, the Oh yeah, I can see that now. Select one of them to be from yes. the next one's secondary objectives. Right, that's, yeah. I that's think why they that... are not that overpowered, because you need to, you know, choose one of the categories and just one of them for at all. So it's not like a big deal that you take all three from the Necron Codex. You just pick one of them. Yeah, definitely. So so you can't stack up if they're all ridiculous. I mean, uh, you, you can mm -hmm. only pick one. And uh, I think that's that's a nice... It's a nice way to add a little bit of flavor to the armies and also just increase the range of secondary objectives you can pick. Right, so let's let's go through them quickly. So uh, there is one to, uh, that falls into the category of no mercy, no respite. It's called Code of Combat and it's an endgame obje objective that lets you score three victory points at the end of the battle for each enemy unit that was destroyed by a Necron Noble unit yeah. from your army. Okay, give me your opinion on that one. It's pretty weak. I mean, uh, yes, our nobles are better in combat than they were before, but it's still pretty hard to do it, really. Yeah, so... Nobles are only overlords, lords, and uh, <laughs> Catacom command barges. And as well as Sherak, so... Obviously. Yeah, and kick and one should play some things, but yeah, it's not gonna happen though, really often. Mm -hmm. And well, he'd need to kill at least five units to to max yeah. it out. So 
It's pretty hard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then we have two objectives in the battlefield supremacy group. First one is purge the vermin, and it's a progressive objective, which and scores great. two victory points at the end of your turn for each table quarter that does not have any enemy units excluding aircraft wholly within it, and it can't be scored in the first battle round. Yes, and the most important thing is that it's counted at the end of your turn. So yeah. you have like four turn to remove enemy from like, let's say two quarters and to score then four points for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that one. This one is great. Right. Yeah, that's true. I agree. Totally agree on that one. It will be probably one of the picked always. <laughs> if not, the, there is a second one, which is a good one, but we will get to it. Okay. Uh, and then the other in Battlefield Supremacy is the Treasures of Aeons. And uh, if you select this one, then after both players have finished deploying, the opponent gets to choose three objective markers on the battlefield. And then you score a number of victory points at the end of your turn if you control one or more of those objective markers. And it's uh, two points for one, uh, three points for two, and the five for holding all three of the ones picked by your opponent. It's pretty weak, I think, and because I mean, it depends on the mission as well, because if you have like mission when there is a one objective in your opponent uh, zone and like two in the middle ground, he will probably choose one in his zone and two in the middle ground, right? So you have big chance of scoring those three victory points. But if there yeah. is a battle when you have like two, uh, two objectives in his zone, he will probably choose two of them and it will be pretty hard to get it in the first turns and you will lose a lot of points. On this one. Yeah, exactly. It's very mission dependent. And like you said, if there is a mission with six objectives and there are three uh, in either deployment zone, so close to them, so basically on each half of the, the board, then it's going to be almost impossible to score it reliably. Yes, that's, that's right. Yep. Okay, and then in Shadow Operations, the Actions category, you could say, we have Ancient Machineries. That's a quite a lot of text here. Yeah, uh, I can summarize it pretty fast. So, uh, okay, go on. <laughs> so, uh, you have like three objective markers and it's starting with your opponent and they like choose those objective markers, which are in no man's land. Uh, up to all, you have like up to three markers. So they usually like, and so depending on the mission, so they can have like one, two or three of them uh, in the no man's land. Mm -hmm. And then you can make action with your Necron core or Nectar Conoptic units. And if you finish this action, you gain three victory points for each completed action. Which is a lot. Yeah, and uh, it's one or more Necron units, so you can actually yeah. scan, let's call it, the three markers in one turn if you if you want yeah. to. Exactly. So yeah, you can right. have three units running three different markers in the middle of the zone, um, in the middle of the uh, battleground, and you gain nine victory points in this turn, which is a lot, really. Yeah, I mean, it's two turns and you max it out. That's, yes. that's pretty good. That's very good uh, in the right conditions, obviously. Of course, it depends on the mission because when you have mission with like one or two in the middle, it's only six, but it's still six per buff round. It's a lot. Yeah, definitely. And uh, well, I mean, you can pick one of these four. You can't take all of them, like you said, and I did not notice that bit earlier. And uh, well, there are some interesting options to choose from. And I think that's that's also how it should be. There isn't one auto pick for each possible mm -hmm. scenario. Exactly. Cool. All right. Uh, right. Are you then. starting to collect Necrons now? Uh, well, I got the Indomitus box, but we'll see. <laughs> 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 I mean, the the, long, the longer we talk, the the more I want to go and buy some spooky boys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's move on to the next question. Right, so we've mentioned already that uh, there weren't many competitive Necron builds in the 8th. Uh, yeah, there were only like one or two. And uh, in the West... Maybe three. Maybe three. Maybe three. 
And in the West, we've seen mainly this composing of, uh, for example, free doomsday arcs and free doom scythes, uh, or sometimes I've seen a list running just free seraptic heavy constructs, the giant forge world spider things. And uh, you've played two different lists, I think, uh, although I'm not Three. that certain of it. Okay. I've uh, played all of them, actually. So maybe I will just talk a little bit about it. So uh, the list with three Doom as the Ark and three Doom sites, which we called uh, Doom 6, which you have, you have three, six units of Doom something, right? Yeah. Uh, which was actually invented by me and one guy from US. Uh, right after the chapter approved in 2019, I think, when the Doom sites got reduced massively in points. And there were like two different builds for this kind of uh, list, which was uh, either you run like a lot of immortals adding to it, or you can add like bikes or destroyers to it. And it was very popular at the beginning. I played this list a lot. But when people learn how to avoid Doom sites, it wasn't that effective anymore. Uh, so I moved to the list with, well, I have, I think I didn't use 27 Tomb Blades. I think I used like uh, 18 at the max. Uh, I remember the only one time we've played, you had 18, I think. Yeah, I have 27 in my home, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think I used only 18 and max, so uh, it was like 18 Doom Blades, like three Doom, uh, Doomsday Arcs, three Doom Sides, some Destroyers or something like this. So this is, was the second type of list, which we had like everything would fly, so you couldn't lock it in combat, uh, and like everything was like shooty, 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 shooty. Uh, it was yeah, with fun. Teslas it's... and exploding sixes and fives yeah. and fives, at that yes. time as well. Yes. So yeah, that was the second. And the, and I had the third list, which I pretty much invented at the eighth. I mean, late of the eighth edition, which was like you called Silver Tide, <laughs> and it was pretty cool list. I really liked it. So it required like a lot of warriors. It required uh, Nemesor and Obiron and the guy with, uh, and the cryptic, for example, with uh, uh, Veil of Darkness. So how did, or, or you could use Deceiver for it as well. So how it worked, if you moved with Deceiver or Veil of Darkness, uh, Nemez or uh, Zandrek, like next to your enemy, and then with this use, like ability from Vanguard Obiron, to move a unit of warriors with him next to Nemezor. So you were like three inches from an enemy with 20 warriors in turn one, <laughs> which was pretty funny. And you still could charge with them. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, because you can't, you, you couldn't charge with stuff that you move with the deceiver, right? But Oberon yeah. didn't have that restriction. Yeah, because he moved with his heal to the Zanderak with the mm -hmm. warrior. Yeah, yeah, totally and different ability. The, the biggest advantages of this move was that uh, you could use it every turn. So you charge with your 20 warriors on something, you tie it up, you just, you know, punch it in the face, and then next turn your enemy could go, you know, fall back or do nothing pretty much in the, like, shooting phase uh, with this unit. And your, on your next turn, you do the same, so you teleport 20 warriors again next to the Zandek with Oberion, so you're again like two inches from your enemy, you shoot them and you charge them again. Mm. Yeah, sounds nice. <laughs> uh, it's not imp it's impossible to do it now, so don't worry. Yeah, uh, I, that's the impression I got reading Oberon's datasheet. Uh, right, but which... Should, he's still fun, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say, it's, he's still fun character. Okay, uh, because that leads us to the question, where are these units and this bu and these builds now? Are they still viable and why, why not? Uh, so first of all, Doom sites are pretty bad now. I mean, there are no more this stratagem. There is a different stratagem that works totally different than before. Uh, you could use one, but they are super expensive. There are like 200 points per one Doom site, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, their weapon is much better now, 
because it's like heavy free and it deals free plus the free damage, which is much better than D6, right? Definitely. Uh, but they are too expensive. So this makes the build with Doom 6 not Doom 6 anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Tomb Blades are still great, I think. I mean, maybe not 18 because they are they are pretty expensive. They are like 300 points per full unit. But I think like having one unit of them is still good. Uh, you could use multiple units, like the smaller units as well, to like you know take quarters in the, in the mission or something like this, because they are still extremely fast. Mm -hmm. As for destroyers, destroyers are I think they are gone. At last, the shooting destroyers, and the new ones which are like uh, super heavy. I mean, they are replacing the heavy destroyers from eighth edition. They are too expensive for what they are doing. And the new, uh, I mean, the old destroyers and the normal ones, like they are as well too too expensive for what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't think that you will be seeing normal destroyers. You might see those new heavy destroyers from some time to time, but uh, yeah, I don't think so that they will be shown a lot. Okay. As for warriors, yes, you will oh. see them a lot. Definitely. Maybe, yes, because they are super cool and super resilient. Uh, if they are going to be with Nemesor and Oberon, they might be, because Nemesor and Oberon are pretty good now. Uh, for example, from Nemesor, you got free Vect once per battle. If you didn't know. Yeah, I knew that, and uh, that is obviously great. It's one of the better abilities to have in the whole game. So. And, and it works always. It, 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 it cannot be stopped because it's not a stratagem, so you cannot counter it with your Vect. <laughs> and and it, you don't need to roll for it. Yes. It just happens. Yes, exactly. And it's pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, and Oberon is just like a bit stick. I mean, he punch hard and he teleports around uh, after the thunder. Run. So, um, they are like cool guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but but he only teleports is... himself now, right? Yes, yes, he only teleports himself and he can do it every turn as well. So, yeah, but the problem with them, you need to pick Sautek for them. And Sautek. It's okay, but it's not that great, I think, anymore. Mm -hmm. There might be builds for them because I, I really like, you know, having a, having a, a counter tactic. Uh, it's pretty cool. And Zand, uh, Zandek is pretty nice because he can buff your units now as well. I mean, he could buff it before, but, yeah, before... but now you have a chance of picking the effect. Exactly. And this is huge. So, yeah. I think they, they might be seen. And as I said, the Silver Tide is back in business. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's for sure. Um, right, so uh, that interlaps with the next question then. Uh, in your opinion, biggest winners of the Codex? Uh, obviously Nightbringer. Uh, <laughs> if you, if you want to start with him, go ahead. Uh, sure. So. Yeah, Catans are now, first of all, let's say about the restrictions, they are once per detachment. So you can have only one of them in each detachment. Second, they are pretty expensive because uh, Deceiver, Nightbringer, and Void Dragon each are 350 points. Uh, Tesseract Vault is 500 points. And Transcendent Catan is like 270 points, if I remember correctly something like that yeah so they are pretty expensive but what they bring to the table is horrifying really so we talked about the powers already which are pretty cool and now they change the deceiver nightbringer and the new guy void dragon no two powers and can cast two powers before they knew two powers but could cast only one so that's already a big change mm -hmm. they got their unique ones as well so that's pretty cool and so, yeah, the most important thing, they got new Necrodemis rule, which is, <laughs> this is obnoxious, really. I mean, this is scary thing. I mean, they give you four plus environment save, like before, 
but now you can lose only three wounds per phase. And combining it with their living metal, if you are fighting versus like army that only shoots, it will take them like four turns to kill a uh, shard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, have fun with this. Uh, as for their weapons, they are much better now as well. So we already, I already talked about that there is a stratagem that allows you to ignore environment style for them, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool for Deceiver or Void Dragon, <laughs> but Nightbringer, right? You wanted to hear about it. So mm -hmm. now he has uh, more strange because he has seven strange, seven toughness, nine wounds, six attacks, which you think, well, it's not a lot, right? But he can... <laughs> it's hit. enough. <laughs> it's enough because... <laughs> He has two types of swing with his side. One is that uh, he can make like double of his attacks, so like 12 attacks with minus three AP at strength seven, uh, one damage, and on the VS two plus. Sounds pretty good, but now you come to his special abilities, which tells that the models uh, that cannot ignore wounds from his attacks. So if you could like feel no pain or anything else, you don't have it. And also, uh, with what has been clarified in an updated FAQ to the main rule book, if you have a rule that, uh, well, similar to the Necrodermis one, that you can only lose a specific number of wounds per phase, the Nightbringer ignores that also. Yes, exactly. And now we come to his big attack, which is double his strength, which is strength 14, minus 4 AP, D6 damage and ignore invulnerable save and ignore, of course, uh, feel no pains as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is like, okay, so let's fight Mortarion, let's fight Death Guard, let's fight Mortarion, I mean, uh, Magnus, pick one and I can kill them with one turn. Yeah, yeah, he basically deletes any big guys. Yes, exactly. And them for breakfast. Exactly. And as for Void Dragon, he do pretty much the same, but for the uh, vehicles. Mm, yeah, but, uh, and he's still quite a viable choice, isn't he? Void Dragon? Yep. Uh, I think the Nightbringer is a little better than him because he's more flexible. Uh, yeah, definitely more universal. Yeah, but Void Dragon is, and the problem with Void Dragon is, firstly, he doesn't have model yet. Secondly, his base is huge. <laughs> it's, I think it's like 50 millimeters or 60 millimeters big, and Nightbringer like got 50 millimeters. So it's like, it's I, bigger. I, I it's play with big. models on hundreds, so <laughs> it's okay. not that big. <laughs> okay, I mean, but it's still harder to hide him because definitely they are characters, but you can target them normally with your range attacks, so you yes. cannot hide them. Yeah, they have a special rule called Enslaved Star God that makes them not benefit from Lookout Sir. Exactly. Which is, uh, I think it's fair enough because if they would get Lookout Sir, they would be insane. <laughs> yeah, they would be pretty much unkillable exactly. with the Necrodermis and Living Metal along with that. Exactly. So I'm happy that they did it. You st they are still hard to kill, let's say it, right? Because you can hide them behind buildings because they get nine wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, they still benefit from dense cover. Uh, but yeah, mm, you can kill them, but pretty hard. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right, uh, let's move on. What what else is there? A oh, winner. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think the biggest winner, other than Nightbringer uh, and other Catans, are the Leech Guards. And the guys with the shield of obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, because now they got pretty much the uh, new Storm Shield what makes them like four plus in vermin save and two plus normal save, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they still got two wounds and five toughness, but now they got three attacks, which is one more than before. And it, it's a strange six minus three, one damage. And what's the best way I think about them is that they are core unit. 
and you can buff them with many different things. And there is, for example, a combination which costs a lot of points <laughs> and a lot of investments, but you can have Lich Guards with shield that each of them have three attacks at strain, uh, at uh, VS 2 plus, rerolling one to hits with strength nine and rerolling wounds at AP minus three and one damage each. So the unit of 10 is like 60 attacks. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like it can punch through a lot, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's nice, but they have lost the stratagem that could give them a free up and vulnerable. Yes, they lost it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a shame because their shields were always special, but they are cheaper now. So, I mean, they have other stratagems that work with them. So one is like they can have plus one attack and they can have plus one strength from the for the one CP each of them. So mm -hmm. they are pretty good. Yeah, so you can definitely buff them up offensively. Yes. And the bigger winners, I mean the second big winners I think are uh, immortals because they got like toughness five now and two attacks each in close combat. Uh, I mean I know that they are shooting, not you know close combat guys, but you know in nine edition I think you always are fighting somewhere, right? So those two attacks are pretty nice. And toughness five on those guys is pretty good. Okay. Okay. I'm surprised to hear that. I didn't hear about immortals being that great now. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, maybe... the last big winner is the Conoptic Spiders, <laughs> which everyone will be surprised when they see them on the uh, table, but they are pretty good now. Okay. Well, that's, that's also, that's nice. It's a nice model. Yes. So it's going to be great to see them again on the table, because like we've said, I don't think they've appeared in eighth. Yeah, there so are many they've... more units that are, you know, get a lot better in this edition, but I mean, let's not like go every single model, right? Like, yeah. I, I can say that bigger losers of this are a monolith, unfortunately, which was previous, I mean, it was like, a, you know, everyone was excited about the new model, right? But the rules yeah. for it aren't that great. That's the problem. I mean, he's huge, big model with eight movement without fly that you need to take in your Lord of War slot. And that's the problem for it. No, it doesn't have fly. It's no, they remove it. It was, it had fly before, but it doesn't have. Oh, that's going to be tough to move around the table. Yeah, it, it's like it's the trash bin. I mean, <laughs> it's such a big thing that you cannot move between buildings with it. It's bigger than night, so. Yeah, so that's that says a lot. And uh, yeah, I think knights have problems moving around the WTC boards at least. So. So the, the, it's not looking good for the monolith as well then. Yeah, because it's bigger. <laughs> right, well, that's too bad. Uh... Maybe they will change it. I don't know. I mean, if they make it cheaper, maybe. Uh, yeah, we will see. I mean, for now, I, I don't see him in the any list. Okay. Okay, well, that's, that's sad as it's getting a new model, like we've said. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about winners and losers of the book. So what about some list ideas? Give us something. Uh, hopefully you're <laughs> willing to share something you're going to test soon. Yes, so I'm going to test something pretty soon. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't play 9 edition before. I mean, because I had a broken arm and I couldn't play at all. But now I'm back and full strength and I got like a lot of ideas for Necrons and I got new book, etc. So the timing my, is perfect. Yeah, I mean, my resurrection protocol is just finished. So <laughs> they I kicked in. Exactly. Uh, so living metal worked. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the list that I'm gonna test is uh, I'm going to have like 30 immortals. Uh, it's just going to be battalion of Nihilak. So uh, everything will have objectives secured, and everything will ignore AP minus one if I'm in my deployment zone. Mm -hmm. And I will have 30 immortals, uh, 10 with Gauss and 20 with Tesla in three units, so each unit for 10. Uh, I think I would 
pick more Gauss over Tesla, but I don't have 10 Gauss because they were not the cool ones in 8th edition. <laughs> so I need to buy more of them. Uh, so this is my troops. And then I have uh, 10 niche cards with shields, which have, again, objective secure and they are pretty fast. I can punch stuff and they're pretty resilient. And then I have something that will, I think, uh, surprise you. Annihilation Barge. Okay, yeah, that is surprising. Uh, from the opinions I've read on the internet, they're apparently not so good, to put it lightly. Uh, so, yeah, what I like about them is they are 125 uh, points because I'm giving them a, a Gauss Cannon. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have like 10 shots with uh, twin Tesla destructors, which is like strange seven Teslas and they shoot like one destroyer. But what I like about them is that they have objective secure and they are pretty fast and they are vehicle as well. So they can fly around, pick up the objectives and someone charge me. I still have objective secure. I can still shoot them in combat and I'm pretty resilient as well. So this yeah. is the reason that I'm why I'm taking it. And they don't degrade, which is they, yeah. a good thing. So And they... they have new quantum shielding rule. Because it changed and we didn't talk about it. And I think the big That's change true. for Micros. We uh, didn't so, mention it. Yeah, so quantum shielding now isn't like it was before that you you know you are a jerk and you love um, six, six damage weapons, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and rolling ones. <laughs> yes, exactly. So now it gives you just five plus environment save, and it gives you transhuman physiology uh, transition from uh, uh, from uh, space marines, which you can always wound it on only four plus. So mm. it's pretty nice. Uh, I, I mean, I, I like all the version more, but I'm okay with this version. I mean, it's not bad. And the data gem from quantum shielding now improves the environment save to four plus. Uh, it's not like reducing damage again, but it's, you know, improving your, mm -hmm. uh, uh, environment save. Yeah, well, okay. the, the rule has changed, so it had to be modified accordingly mm -hmm. after all. So yeah, I, I like Annihilation Barge. Uh, I'm going to test it and see how it works. Uh, the, the, the only way I took this, I said, it's an objective secure model, which a lot of movement. Uh, so talking about fast movement units, I have eight Tom Blades with Gauss. Why Gauss? Because Gauss is much better now than Tesla. It has more range and it, they have pretty fun stratagem where you can advance them and all your weapons are changing to assault and you are ignoring minus uh, to hit with assault as well. So your Gausses become Teslas pretty much. Yeah, well, just without the exploding hits. No, no, no. There is a touch of them for Gauss weapons that explode oh, your yes, shots. Oh, there is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they're fun. Yeah, definitely. Uh, then I have five death marks, which are again a new thing. Uh, I'm gonna test them. I, I like them because they have more range now, and they are 36 inches range. Uh, they have AP minus two now as well, and if and they get ballistic skill of two plus, so and five toughness, so like improved in all ways, mm -hmm. and you can park them in your. Uh, let's say near deployment zone in some drawings near objective and you will have like two plus ignore minus one AP guys sitting in the ruin holding objective with objective secure and shooting some characters. Uh, that's, that's the reason and they only like 90 points for it. And uh, now with their stratagem uh, you can also uh, redeploy them if someone's deep striking mm -hmm. in and then shoot them. Not they really. Not redeploy. You can shoot no? them, but not. Yeah. Oh, so the okay. But the gem have like two entries. One, if the 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 unit is in a hyperspace, they can uh, drop down like, and shoot. Drop down and shoot, and or if they are on the battle uh, on the board, you can shoot them. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. It's it's still okay. I, I don't know why I thought that you can also uh, jump them with that. That would be it. Awesome, but yeah. still good. <laughs> cool. 
Uh, so then in my roster, I have Nightbringer <laughs> because, because he's Nightbringer. And that's pretty much all of the units. And in my HQ slots, I have uh, Sheras, which are really love the new Sheras. I mean, he is super cool. I mean, he has like the last cannon shots with his staff. Uh, he can improve the uh, all of my units pretty much because they changed the rule. Uh, so let, let's say uh, so Sheras had a, like his unique ability, which allowed you to enhance your warriors or immortals, uh, giving them plus one strength, uh, plus one toughness of ballistic skill until end of the battle. Now it works on all core units, so you can buff your tomb blades to toughness six. Or you can buff your uh, immortals. I mean, your uh, leech guard to strange six or toughness six, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, that's a definite improvement. Yes, and then I have Overlord because I need to have Noble uh, to my command protocols to work, mm. and I have something new which is Royal Warden. So this guy is a new type of character from Necrons. Uh, and it allows you to pick one of your core units in your command phase, and it, this unit can fall back and still be able to shoot or charge this phase. Yeah, that's a, that's a useful ability to have. Although in the Indomitus booklet, he did have the noble keyword, so it's it's a shame that, he's uh, lost it. Yeah, it's pretty shame, but. Whatever, uh, yeah. I mean, its main rules remain the same, right? Yeah. So you can use it on Tom Blades. You can use it on your Immortals. You can use it on your Death Marks. You can use it on your uh, Lich Guards. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've named all five of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I get all of core ruins. Uh, yeah, and this is the list. It's nine uh, nineteen ninety nine points. So. Okay, and it's OPSEC everything, I think that's, that's yes. the huge thing. Uh, without uh, Nightbringer. Of and course. Sarah, and, it's a, and Yeah, because Ktan shards and dynastic agents don't benefit from, yeah, from the true. dynastic codes. Uh, unless they are Silent King. Uh, yeah, because he has his um, dynasty oh, keyword uh, as well. Dragon, yeah. Yep, right. And uh, any other ideas? Or... So you could be a secret. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm not gonna give you exact details, but you can build pretty nice build around Conoptex, like I said before, with Vrites, uh, with uh, spiders, uh, with uh, scarabs, uh, and give like a cryptic with buff all of those units. Uh, you can build nice list with your destroyers cult as well because those mad destroyers are pretty sweet now. They got stratagem for one CP, so you can activate it in your shooting phase or combat phase that gives enemy minus one to wound them. So they are more resilient now. And uh, comparing to Indomitus book, you can build them in the unit of six now. Mm. Uh, and they also got five points cheaper per model. Yes, yes, exactly. So there are ways to build like a army around the uh, uh, destroyer cult or like Conoptex uh, or like a core units like I did. Uh, I think there is a one more thing that is worth mentioning here, like one unit, uh, which is a new one, and it's Conoptex Doomstalker. Yeah, that guy seems a bit pushed. Yes, but he is like amazing because he has Conoptic keyword, so you can buff his uh, ballistic skill with the uh, cryptic, uh, so he can have three plus ballistic skill. He never degrade with his ballistic skill, so he's always on three plus in that way. He has four plus environment safe, and he's shooting like a doomsday arc. Mm. And the funny rule that he works like a towel. So every time someone charts your units uh, and he is in six inches of them, he can shoot overwatch uh, with his big gun and small guns. And the big gun is always shooting with the high profile. Yeah, and uh, they have a very interesting strategy as well. Yeah, when you kill some character, they can like get buffed or shoot the unit that was that killed your character, which is funny. And is it just one Doomstalker or all the Doomstalkers you might have on the board? 
I that think gets to shoot. only one, but let me jump to it really fast because I wasn't looking at it really because I don't have this model. Uh, it's uh, and if, uh, one, select one friend, you cannot have done start. And yeah, that would have been a bit much if, yeah, if three you could three shoot at once. <laughs> three to six big shots, like, yeah, have fun. Don't kill my cryptic guy. Yeah. <laughs> Right, okay. Yeah, there are many ways that you can build your army now. That's that's what I love about this college. There are so many ideas. When, when I was building this for my, my like, let's say, first list that the test, I had like 10 different ideas, which are like, I liked all of them. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that says a lot. And that's, uh, like I've mentioned before, I think that's how everyone would want the armies to to work and just to have the options of running different play styles with uh, suitable units exactly so that's that's definitely great to hear that necrons seem to have a good book now okay uh i think we're done on the necrons then uh thanks Neiltech, for coming in and walking us through the book uh yeah sharing your optimism and uh yeah we'll definitely see where the spooky boys are in the meta and how are they faring in upcoming tournaments uh i think i didn't mention it in the beginning but we also have the polish team championship coming up on the 17th and 18th of october the lists are in and uh, you can find the link to that in the description of the video uh, so you can have a look at them uh, if you're welcome to share your thoughts with us and uh, I think at one point maybe next week we are going to go through some of them and uh, are you going to participate there? Uh, no I'm not uh, unfortunately I've got a couple of uh, private stuff piling on that day so I'm not, not going there as well because I didn't want to play old Necrons with new rules already out. So, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I totally get that. I also don't like playing old rules when there are new rules in. So that cut of day, which was uh, I think the first of October. So yes. uh, no new Necrons, no new Space Marines. Uh, it's just nah, it's right? sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's not for me. Uh, but anyway, uh, the tournament is hopefully happening, although we've got some restrictions back here in Poland coming in, so we'll see, but all well, fingers crossed it's going to go. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely be on that topic. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, again, thanks Neiltek for joining in. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Until Thank then. You. Happy Wargaming and bye-bye. Bye all.